Reason Magazine's Volokh Conspiracy, which is also in Washington Post. Uh, so his opinion is quoted kind of all across the uh, political spectrum. It, it's hard to miss me. I'm kind of everywhere. Um, but we're pleased to host you, Professor Blackman, for a discussion on academic diversity in the law school setting. Professor, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my first time speaking in New Hampshire, so it, it, it's actually lovely to be here. Let's see if I can pull this off with two screens at once. Um, the topic today is academic diversity in academia. And a central component of any kind of academic diversity is free speech. Um, if people are not able to speak freely, um, then only one view will prevail. Uh, we often think of diversity in terms of facial characteristics or ethnicity or religion or other types of uh, physical aspects. Uh, but diversity also extends to diversity of thought. Not everyone agrees. We live in a republic that has differences of opinions. And a central focus of that issue is speech. Now, you all are sitting here very quietly uh, listening to me respectfully. Uh, but that's not always how I'm received on campus. Um, a couple years ago, I was invited to give a speech at the CUNY Law School in Queens. My topic, ironically enough, was free speech on campus. And they protested me. So I actually want to start off this lecture by showing you some video of a protest I had a couple years ago. I'll play, play a few clips. That's like 25,000 views on YouTube, so it's good. Uh, and just so you can see how it goes. Okay. Oh, I almost missed it. So this is my favorite sign, actually. Uh, I'll applause one more time so you can see. It goes by quickly. <clears throat> Okay, Federal Society's racist, Josh Blackman's racist, that, that's me. Free speech, say, it's not licensed trade speech. So, this sign, by the way, guilty as charged. <laughs> Your legal analysis is lazy and wrong. Okay, I'll I'll uh, <laughs> I'll I'll give her that one. Conservative hate does not equal intellectual debate. Now this guy was actually being a bit of a jerk. He tried to block me. You'll see it in a second. I kind of pushed him aside. So he's standing in front of the door, and I just kind of stiff armed him out of the way. And then we go inside. That's like four people in there. So <laughs> let me now give you the back round story of what was going on there. Um, <clears throat> the CUNY Law School in Queens uh, is perhaps the most progressive law school in the country. It's founded as a public interest law school. And it's almost entirely people who agree on one side of the political spectrum. In fact, Democrats are actually too conservative. The Socialist Party is actually have a, has a greater share of the constituency. Uh, there is a Federal Society chapter there. There are a couple of people, they were hardy and strong, who invited me to give a talk about free speech on campus. Um, a couple days before the event, one of the students sent me an email and he said, uh, we passed out flyers today and students are already up in arms about the event. And students are planning to protest. Now, I showed you what happened. I actually, I didn't believe him, right? I thought there's no way students actually protest me. I'm not important enough to protest, right? Why, why would you waste your time? So why were they protesting me? Well, they saw that I'm a Federal Society member. I've written a National Review. Uh, I've been critical of DACA. I've been critical of the Obamacare law. And my talk on free speech is racist. Um, the administration supported my talk, which was good. CUNY is a public law school. They have a First Amendment, governs them as well. Um, shortly before the event, the dean sent an email to the students 
and basically said we have to welcome all points of views. Okay, so far, so good. Um, shortly before the event began, I spoke with the public safety officer. He said that there were a few dozen students, and we saw them all, standing in the hallway. They actually had gathered earlier that day. They passed out poster board and magic markers and were making you know, science together. That, that's what law students do, I suppose. Um, I asked, were they going to drop me? He said he didn't know. Then he asked me a question that I'm never going to forget. He said, what is your exit plan? My what? Your exit plan. He wanted to know how I was going to leave the building in the event of an emergency. In other words, if they rushed me, where was it going? I said, I don't know. I'll take an Uber. He's like, okay, good. You're not going on the subway. I'm like, oh. So at that point, for the first time in my legal career, I was actually worried about my own safety. Um, you'll see, don't hurt me. But at least the school was worried that they may try to rush me. Uh, we've seen videos of students who are promoting inclusivity, physically excluding students from their student bodies, as it were. Um, I just played the first 30 seconds of the clip. <clears throat> you saw me walking through the campus. You know, some of the signs said conservative hate is not intellectual debate. My views are not welcome on their campus. I was a racist. I was a Nazi. I was a bigot. I was a homophobe. Whatever you want. Go down the list. They called me all these names. Um, and I get to the classroom, and as you can see, it's empty. There were about 50 people protesting me in the hallway, and about four people were actually in the classroom to see me speak. And I'm like, huh. So I walk in. And they're chanting, and they're shouting, and they're shouting. Okay. Something, all right, whatever. They're going to be screaming outside. No big deal. I'm going to do my, by the way, my hair is too much shorter, if you can tell. Uh, this is my pre-COVID hair. Then they came into the room, and they circled all the way around the perimeter of the room. And they settled inches behind me. Right? And you can see they're standing inches behind my shoulder. Um, at that point, I realized, okay, this is not going to be over quickly. Now, what did they want? What they wanted was basically an incident, right? They wanted me to flip out at them, start screaming at them, call them a bunch of snowflakes, right? They wanted me to flip out at them. And I wasn't going to do that. I actually had a game plan ready. I was not going to say a word to them. And I was going to stand there quietly and wait for them to leave. They were not going to remove me, and I wasn't going to give them what they wanted. Okay, and that's the chapter president, kind of like Joseph over here, right? Uh, saying, can you guys get out? The front's reserved for speakers. You want to grab this? Thanks so much. Yeah, I forgot to plug it in. All right. So you see what happens here is they ask students to move to the back, um, but they wouldn't, right? They wouldn't go to the back of the room, OK? At this point, someone from the administration should have come in, but they didn't. All right, let me play a little bit more. So shame on CUNY gives oppressor as a platform. So he's gonna to try to introduce me. There are students that are directly affected by 
Legal objectivity is a myth. Legal objectivity is a myth. You just heard what she said. Legal objectivity is a myth. It gets better. So, Tell me white supremacist. Well, thank you very much to Q for having me. So I'm not going to talk all over them. Okay, so this part is actually kind of weird. There was actually an African American guy sitting in the, in the in the room, and they were like, "You're here supporting white supremacy. The fact that you're sitting here." And this was a black guy, and he's like, "I'm not a white supremacist." So they're basically shaming this guy in the back who wants to come see my talk. Like, why aren't you with us? This one of the deans. People get to speak. You may protest. You may protest, but you may not keep anyone from speaking. If you do, I have other things to do. I will be back. She never came back, by the way. Or you can resolve this yourself. They resolved themselves. Yourself. No, she didn't do anything. Why are you being racist against all? How many ways did I? Why haven't you provided support for saying you're affected by these issues? You hear. You're not children. You can't talk to us. Please don't. So there's a professor in the back who's telling their students, don't take the bait, as if I'm baiting them. I'm seeing if they're a number 50 to 1. Like, don't take my bait. Okay, fine. I'm threatening them. So... All right, so about five minutes in, I actually try to open my mouth, right? And reject the myth of legal objectivity. Josh Blackman is not welcome at Kinney Law. Congratulations, you may be very feel. See, I'm, white, I'm white and afraid of everything. That's that sign. Not welcome, but I'm still going to say what I'd like to say. <laughs> so I actually want to start. I actually want to start by using the one legal argument you actually made. You said. So they'd actually pass around these pamphlets with basically a cancellation list of, re of things I've done that were inappropriate and all these things I've said in the completely out of context. So I said, let me actually work with their list they gave around. Violence and just the law. And it's a myth that law is inherently neutral. Okay? He said there's a myth of legal objectivity. So let's talk about legal objectivity for a few minutes, right? Someone did some excellent opposition research. I'm going to give this plug. We found that seven or eight bullets on various videos I've given over the years. But I want to make a few points. For example, you wrote that I supported the president's decision to reach a doc. And let me tell you something. I actually support the Dream Act. This might surprise you. I actually think the Dream Act is a good piece of legislation. Gaslighting. And gaslighting. I was gaslighting them. Oh, let me speak, please. And we're in. And we're in. And were a member of Congress, I would vote for the Dream Act. My position 
is that the policy itself is not consistent with the rule of law, which teaches a lesson, right? The lesson is this. You can support something as a matter of policy. So at this point, they're getting quiet. They've lost their energy. They've lost their mojo, right? Policy, but then find that the law doesn't permit it. And then the answer is to change the law. Fuck the law. You heard it? Fuck the law. I said, if you don't like the law, change it. The response was, fuck the law. So they thought I went there to try and trigger a protest. That, that's what they thought. These people were deluded. I had no idea this was happening. It never happened before. But they actually thought I deliberately went there to troll them. Well, if you want to do something, you can't even speak. So fuck the law, right? That's a good mantra. Fuck the law. You do. And I'm actually very impressed. Let me say this. I'm actually impressed that there are so many of you. You can be anywhere right now. And you chose to come out here and exercise your constitutional rights. You want to exercise your rights? I'll do the same. And I'm here to say, so I'm going to express my views. So let me go down this list here. This little checklist, right? I need DACA. They're done. They had no more. Please leave. I need DACA. is a good policy. I think you're tired. I think you're tired. It's like a two year old. You're tired. They had nothing left. Okay, you've seen enough, I think. Maybe I'll come back to it later. All right, so why did I just spend, you know, 20 minutes playing this video for you? These are all law students who are probably roughly your age. They're at a law school in New York City, not terribly far from here, a couple states away. And these kids have probably already gone to take the bar and they're practicing lawyers by this point. What led them to behave like this? You're all sitting here respectfully, no one's yelling at me or screaming at me. They're led to believe that certain ideas are actually dangerous. Not the exercise of those ideas or even the expression, but merely my presence is enough that if I exist on their campus, that I am, you know, going to harm them. And why might they think this? Well, it's what they learn in their classrooms. Um, at CUNY Law School, the professors are uniformly left of center. Um, they don't have any professors to teach them otherwise. After this event, and this went on for almost an hour, you can see the, the time on the bottom, a number of CUNY students came up to me and they were actually conservatives. And the students said they live in this almost like Stalinistic fear that at any moment, some of their classmates might find something they did that was offensive and report them to some authority for, for, for re-education. In their classrooms, they are terrified, they are horrified to express their viewpoints and articulate what they think on a given topic for fear that some of their classmates, not even their teachers, their classmates will ostracize them. Um, this is no climate in which people can learn. Um, I use the word Stalinistic, I use the word lightly, but th this fear of ideas is very, very dangerous. Now, how do you fix this problem? How do you address it? Well, one way to address it is through the Federal Society. Maybe some of you are one else, you're new to law school. The Federal Society is a group, a national organization of conservative and libertarian lawyers. Um, they allow speakers like me to sort of come to college campuses. I'm here for an hour, but I'm actually talking about things that you may not otherwise hear in your classrooms. Right? The, the reason why I'm here is to give viewpoints you're not otherwise exposed to. In an ideal world, you'd have this in your own faculty, but maybe you don't. At CUNY, they absolutely do not. So they brought me in for a one hour talk and I was almost kicked out of the campus, okay? But beyond just having a ringer, I come here for an hour at a time once a semester, um, it's helpful to actually have conservative faculty members. 
which is the topic that my colleagues invited me to talk about today. Um, most law school faculties are left of center. I'm not surprised. Me. Most college campuses are left of center. In fact, law schools are probably more conservative than the undergraduate campus because most business professors are not quite as, as, as liberal. Uh, but there's, there's a bias against hiring of conservative professors. Um, most schools have a very strong focus on diversity and inclusion. It's, can't get away from it, it's everywhere. Um, but those policies are largely designed for racial or ethnic diversity, uh, not diversity of thought. Um, I can count on two hands the number of conservative constitutional law professors in the United States. There's just not many of us, I'm one of them. Um, and when students sort of come of age in this, this viewpoint where they only see one side of the views, they tend to think that they're alone. And the message I have for you all is you're not alone. Um, I think New Hampshire perhaps more so than other places, but there is a silent minority of law students who don't agree with the orthodoxies. And I'll just give you a few thoughts and lessons to sort of keep in mind. Um, one of which is don't be afraid that professors might um, you know, discipline you if you don't articulate the standard line, right? The standard perspective, right? Um, it's this fear. I've never actually seen it done in practice. Uh, most 1-0 classes are blind graded, so you don't have to worry about it as much. And the upper level, I think professors welcome different thought, even if they don't agree with it. Um, if you actually do have a professor who retaliates against your political views, you go to the dean. Um, the second point follows from the first. Uh, if you're in a class and it's a professor saying something that you think is absolutely batty, or if a classmate saying something that you think is just absolutely wrong, don't be afraid to voice up. Um, whatever view that you hold, there are probably other people who have the same view, right? And by you sort of opening your mouth, you've now given cover to others who want to do so as well. If everyone keeps your mouth shut, people don't know who believes what. And that's sort of what happens at CUNY. There's just a fear. So in any class, never be afraid to articulate your views. Not for a moment. Um, the third part is actually more useful. So maybe some of your first years or second years. As you go up in law school, you can take seminars. Right? And usually seminars uh, have a paper requirement. Right? You actually have to not, it's not a multiple choice exam. You have to write like a paper for the class. Or maybe on the law review. Um, when you're writing topics for papers, don't shy away from certain topics. Um, write what you're passionate about. Um, general tip, if you pick a boring law review topic, you're going to hate it. Right? But when you're picking a topic for a class, do something that you're passionate about. If it's political, you can have a political angle. Make sure your arguments are supported. Um, but don't shy away from topics or fear that, oh, professor will give me a bad grade because I wrote, you know, whatever case was wrong that, that, that people tend to like. Um, even if you all can't control the academy, right? You can't control who's hired. You can control what's within your power to control. You can speak up in class without fear, write what you believe without fear. When you all graduate, Right? You're going to go into legal practice. Maybe you'll go to a law firm. Uh, maybe you'll go into government service. Uh, maybe you do public interest law. Um, again, be active. Right, uh, Take your beliefs, what you find valuable, and inject it into your work. Um, pro bono is a very important aspect of legal practice. Right, If you're selecting pro bono work, choose causes that are meaningful to you. Um, Help groups that you think need help. You have a very unique gift with a law license. Um, some law firms have very strong political cultures that may not agree with you, that may not be the right firm for you. Right? When you're actually thinking about where you're going to spend your career, these sorts of things matter. I'll just give you an example. Um, there was a firm in the city I live in, and they had summer associates. And they, they basically told all the summer associates that to do a pro bono project for Planned Parenthood. And a couple of the associates were very much pro-life, and they flipped out. Now, fortunately, there was a partner at this firm who said, OK, I'm going to take care of this. Don't worry about it, right? But imagine you're a 2L, right? You got this amazing summer associate job. There's a six-figure salary dangling in front of you. You say, you know what? I'm not going to do this assignment. Uh, go give it to someone else. 
who here has the goal? Who has the goal to do that? Right? You may be like, oh, shit. Um, but the point I'm trying to convey is, you need to stand for your principles, and sometimes you need to find allies and friends who can sort of fight for you, what you believe in. Right? So you can't control the legal culture, which is far greater than you, but you can control sort of what's in your discretion. All right. So there's just some tips to think about. Now, I want to come back to this, what happened to me at CUNY. Um, you saw in the video, they all started leaving and leaving and walking out of the classroom, right? Um, what happened afterwards, right? What happened afterwards? The students went to the dean's office to complain. They went to the dean's office, not to be disciplined, but to complain that they let me speak, right? That, that, was, their, that was their goal. And, and, and they were actually kind of mad, I think. I don't know this, but I think they were mad that I didn't like give them like a scene, right? That I didn't start throwing or cursing at them and saying, get out of here. I didn't call the cops on them. I just sat there and I, I waited because I knew they were gonna lose energy. But they went to the dean to complain. Um, after this, I never heard a word from the school. I left, I never heard from them. The dean never called me. In fact, it's funny, the dean, I actually saw the dean at a conference uh, maybe about a year later. She pretended not to know me. She just like said hi. She walked in. She just does not want to talk to me. It was, it was really funny. Um, this dean actually, it, it gets sad. She made a comment. It, it's so stupid. She, she made a comment that referenced slavery. It was something about slavery. She made some dumb comment referencing slavery. She basically canceled up. She, she, she stepped down as dean because she couldn't. She, there was too much pressure that this woman who was so far progressive inadvertently made a comment about slavery that was considered insensitive by her faculty, and she self-canceled. She, she, she actually resigned as dean. Um, so, I mean, I'm trying to tell you, this culture, it, 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 no one was safe. All right, now we get to the harder point. What should have happened to these students? Right, you know, you are all law students, you signed an honor code, you have one here, an honor code, right? Most schools have one, you have a disciplinary code. Um, if you engage in some sort of misconduct, you can be disciplined. You, you know, perhaps they can suspend you for a semester from class, put a letter in your file for, this, for the bar, you know, character and fitness. You guys don't know what that is, you'll know what that is soon. Um, maybe they could have, um, you know, uh, deny them access to law review or moot court or extracurriculars. Should anything have happened to them? So my views here may actually surprise you. I don't think they should have been punished, even though they went after me, and so this is like, personal, right? I think on balance, I would not have favored their discipline. I think it was a close call. Um, I have rights and they have rights. Now, the reason why I don't think they should be disciplined is actually maybe not what you expect. Disciplining students is often counterproductive because it martyrs them, right? It makes them into martyrs. Um, if these students have been disciplined, it would have been Josh Blackman censoring law students, which is not what I wanted. Um, also, discipline is often inflicted long after the event occurs when people have forgotten why they were there in the first place. So the issue becomes not my initial visit, but the discipline itself. Also keep in mind, with law schools, there's very short memory spans, right? Every year there's a fresh crop of one else who come who don't remember what happened last year. So even a punishment in 2018 would not be remembered by 2020. So on balance, I, I don't think discipline would have been warranted. Uh, in my view, the best approach would have been just to give a stern warning and said, if you do this again, then you get nailed, which I think would have actually been more effective. Of course, the students never invited another speaker because they were so <laughs> flipped out of what happened to me uh, um, at, at CUNY that time. And hello to everyone in Zoom. Yes, that's Josh uh, talking. I see a bunch of people in the waiting room or in the, in the queue. All right. So um, I've talked about 30 minutes. I, 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 I have more, but let me maybe pause for Q&A. Um, make sure I get people some chance to get some questions. So, questions? Yes, what's your name? Uh, Nick. Nick, okay, good. Did you hear back from the uh, Federal Society? Yeah, uh, it got a little messy. Um, so the student who introduced me was a really nice guy, um, very thoughtful guy, uh, but he sort of, he like defended his school in a way that I think was a little bit too much. He, 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 I think he had a vested interest in not pissing off his administration, so he 
he defended how school handled the event, and, and I, I think that was a bridge too far. Um, I emailed him a couple times. Um, you know, he, he the fact that they sent a dean there to give that stern talk, that lady who said, oh, I'll be back, and she never came back, um, he thought that was enough, and, and I don't. I, I think the school could have done more to actually disperse the crowd. It shouldn't have fallen to me to do that, but that's where I think it went error. A funny story, though, on the, on the school, someone started a rumor that I was going to be a graduation speaker. I. I I, I have no idea. It wasn't me, I swear. And then, like, they blew up on Facebook, and, like, they were, like, <laughs> flipping out. There was actually a petition for me to, to boycott the graduation I wasn't speaking at. <laughs> so I don't know. But that's all that happened. No one's invited me back since. Um, just to give you a sense of where Kenya Law School is, that's AOC's district, right? That, that, that's where she lives. Uh, or well, that's where she, she, she represents, at least. Um, so it's a very unique spot of New York. And I'm from New York. I'm from Staten Island. I'm from oh, Staten Island, not really New York, but I'm from that area. But it was just a very weird experience. It, let me just, just to give you more. I give a lot of credit to the students because they could have bailed, right? They could have said, Josh, screw this. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. They could have said, forget this, Josh. We're not doing this. We're not going to go through this stress. So they, they pushed through. So I have no, I only have positive things to say about the students. Just got a little weird afterwards. I think, I think they got freaked out that like this happened, but they, they stood strong during that. Okay, what other questions? Yes. Yeah, so uh, this is largely one side um, by nature of the law school environment. If uh, a bunch of conservative students have done this to a, a, a left wing group on campus activity, um, they would have been kicked off campus. Oh, yeah. Like, this far, like, don't ever come to the stadium. I mean, oh, yeah. It's hyperbolic, but the punishment is not. Oh my God! What, what is to be done about that? Yeah, imagine if instead of doing this to me, they did this to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? They'd be in jail, right? If you had, I'm, I'm not joking. If you had a dozen students standing six inches behind Ruth Bader Ginsburg, they would be in prison. They would be arrested. No, no doubt in my mind. No doubt in my mind, right? Uh, there was actually a law professor. I'm not joking. That oh, it's not that big of a deal. Blackman's a big, strong guy. Oh come on! I'm a tubby person in his mid thirties. Okay, I'm you know I'm not. There were 15 of them. If they wanted to rush me, they would have rushed me in two seconds. I'd be on the floor, right? There was one plainclothes guy in the back, a cop, who was not going to lift his damn finger. So to your question, the double standard, which I think is a, um, you know, it, it, it's a fair question. Um, this is where I think the administration really matters. If they tried to pull this on like an ACLU lawyer or, a, you know, a Planned Parenthood attorney, right? This would have never have been possible. Um, when this happened to me, the right-wing media got up and I was, like, I was on Tucker, I was on Fox News, you know, Laura Ingram, I did all the media, right? No one in the mainstream covered it. They wouldn't cover it. Um, I think it's unfortunate. Now, there are some speakers on the right who, for lack of a better word, like to troll. Milo, right, and Coulter. Maybe like them, I, I've, served, I've grown tired with them over the years. But they go to campus for the sole purpose of generating a negative hostile reaction. I think they make my job hard, right? Because they think I'm like Milo. I look nothing like the guy, right? Um, but even when you have these provocative speakers, the best approach is just to ignore them. Protest outside, not inside. Some schools actually are very good at enforcing it, but this school is, was, was not interested at all. Uh, yes, sir, in the front. Yeah, I was going to ask more about sort of the context that surrounds this. Because people don't show up. Say there was a Holocaust denier who wanted to speak you know, at a history conference. Should the history department be obligated to platform that speaker? Yeah, it's a, re it's a really good question, right? Um, usually I get flat earthers, but the Holocaust, Holocaust denier I think works well, right? Um, I think there are different reasons why you might want to not invite a person, right? If their scholarship is so far beyond the mainstream, they're not contributing to, this, to the spread of ideas. So you mentioned Holocaust denial. I think that's actually a decent example, right? Uh, someone who denies evolution, I think, could, could be in that ballpark as well. Uh, there are actually people who believe the Earth is flat. I swear, they exist. Kyrie Irving might be one of them, right? Uh, these people exist. Um, you know, 
there are probably certain, and you can name them on maybe one hand, or not that many of these topics, whose viewpoints are not contributing to the spread of ideas, they don't warrant an invitation. Now, if they're invited by a student group, then the ballpark changes, right? Because some student group wants them to be there, the university should be very hesitant to cancel that invitation. Uh, most student groups, like for example, on, on your campus, did you need the dean's permission to invite me? No, of course not. Some schools do. Your friends up in Vermont, by the way, Vermont Law School, I spoke there a couple years ago, their dean has approval for outside speakers, right? They do not have autonomy to invite people. So when a university delegates the power to students to invite whom they wish, that discretion should not be uh, interfered with lightly. Um, now, let me try your question differently. If I come to campus and talk about, I don't know, Ruby Wade was wrong, or the Second Amendment protects the right to bear arms, or you know, the, the, the gay marriage decision was incorrectly decided, those are decisions in the mainstream of thought, right? These are five, four decisions, seven, two decisions, right? I'm articulating a view that gets a, a lot of judges in the Supreme Court to agree, perhaps not a majority. But those are views that some people may find offensive or hurtful, right? If the reason why you're excluding is not flat earth Holocaust denying, but because the idea is offensive, then we're in a different ballgame, right? That's an entirely different context. So I think that the rationale for why you might be canceling a speaker matters significantly. significantly. But good question. Uh, yeah, one and then two after that. Good. The importance of free speech on campus. My topic was free speech. What they were protesting was me talking about why the first amendment is important. The irony is not dead, my friends. Um, in their view, free speech was merely a, a shield for white supremacy. It truly, they believed it. I mean, I actually, you can watch the videos on YouTube later. It's got a bunch of views. I stayed there for an hour taking Q&A for them because I realized my, my topic was gone. So I just took questions for them for an hour straight. They legitimately believe that free speech is only used to suppress people of color. That's what it's used for. Um, their historical standard is bizarre because for generations, it was minorities who needed free speech to criticize mainstream policies, right? Now they, they think they're in control so they can stifle everyone else. It's this weird reversal where for generations, progressives needed free speech to sort of elevate their platform. And now they got that platform, they have to shove everyone else down. It's this bizarre power structure where those who were once oppressed now decide to oppress others. It, it, it's, it's a very strange standard. Okay. Yes, go ahead. So do you feel this type of do you question like the idea that this type of behavior when it comes to these speakers that may have this problem? Um especially you know, racist, that it's not it's a phenomenon of other people. Like I, I I don't know what specifically they believe they were also doing this, but do you feel this is a, a new thing or something that's always been happening? Uh yeah, I think there is a generational aspect, right? Keep in mind, you know, people don't become law students overnight. They first have to go to college. And before that, they have to go to high school. Before that, they have to go to elementary school. Before that, they, you know, go to kindergarten, right? There, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a long runway to law school. It doesn't just happen overnight. And I think for these people who probably grew up in New York City, which is in my, my hometown, they were never exposed to people who they disagreed with. They were exposed to one school of thought, and they were taught at every stage that diversity and inclusion is the most important value any society can have. And white supremacy is everywhere, and that's what they learned. I, I swear, people there. I felt like I was when I went to that school. I felt like I was an ambassador from a foreign nation, like you know, entering some foreign court, bringing gifts from the, you know from some some nation. It's like here, here are the gifts from the the Republic of Texas, right? You know, I was like, I was like, like this this diplomat, and like a couple of them said that they'd never actually met a Republican in person. Right, that all they ever seen was like Fox News, the Tucker Carlson type thing. They'd never actually seen a person in the flesh. I'm like, wow, you're not that bad. And let me just give you this. So to show that maybe there's some hope, this might be a point of optimism for you all. There was one guy in the back who he, he was respectful, but just sitting quietly with the sign. The sign said, uh, "You are an oppressor," or something like that. And then at the end of the talk, I you know gave him my car. I was like, well, let's we talk a bit. So we emailed back and forth a few times. And then he wrote me this email that I'll never forget. I still have it. He said, I no longer have enough evidence to conclude that you are an oppressor. That I, I shifted the burden, right? I rebutted the presumption of oppressiveness. I was like, yes, right? 
So I talked to the guy for a few minutes. He's like, wow, you're not what I thought you were. And, and that's like good. That's like a point of optimism that when you actually have interaction with people of different beliefs, they realize they're not so far. Look, you guys are probably all on social media. Get off. I quit Twitter two years ago. I'm such a happier person for it. Right? Because the most simple debates and disagreements on Twitter become absolute part of French shit shows, right? That that people who might find agreement and common cause are just drawn to fight and spar and respond and DM and emoji and meme and and, and just it, it, it's so corrosive to our environment. I wish this stuff had never been invented. Like I, I used to be very I, I have 25,000 followers. I don't even use it anymore. I, I just don't I don't look at it. I haven't checked my notifications since 2020. Just uh, I'm done. But to your point, when you're brought up in that sort of culture, and it's not just in the left. I think there's people on the right who are so intolerant any any contrary viewpoints. Um, uh, it, it, it's quite bad. I I, I love teaching law. I'm a, I teach property. I teach con law. I love those classes because I can expose students to ideas they've never been exposed to before, and they're they're good. They're good to receive them, and no one shouts me down. That's a good question. I try to make it someone new. Anyone else that has a question yet? Yeah, right there. Yeah, so I'm basically very out there with my views and whatnot. So I kind of am used to being that guy where it's like, okay, we know you're a Republican, and they attach like a lot of those things to me. I'm kind of like prejudged. Do you have any kind of strategies to like break down that perception for people to kind of judge you for their view, be able to like have like a conversation with them? Oh man, what a good question. Um, so this is going to sound stupid, but one of the tactics that I use often to disarm people's humor and not humor at all suspenses, but self-deprecating humor. If you notice, I made a couple of jokes about myself there. I was like, oh man, you guys find all this bad stuff about me. I'm lazy. You know, if you can laugh at yourself, it disarms people. Um, I know that sounds stupid, but I've had, even as a, a kid, if you can be able to laugh at yourself and make a joke at your own expense, it confuses the other people. Like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be dragging this kid, now he's dragging himself. It like throws them off. And then it, it actually builds bridges. So uh, humor is important. And look, not everyone likes humor, not everyone likes jokes. Maybe your jokes fall flat. But self deprecating humor is helpful. Um, the second tip that I, I can perhaps give you is try very hard to find some sort of common ground. Uh, and that often involves listening. Um, I know it sounds stupid, but I like to listen to people for a few minutes before I get my opinion, or I'll say, oh, yeah, I'm not sure. You know, e even if you have a strong opinion something, you don't always have to give it right away. And then eventually, if you find a rapport. Now, it's hard because a lot of people have built reputations over many years, which is, I think, what you're hinting at. People sort of know where you are. You know, if you have your views and someone vehemently hates you and doesn't want to get along with you, there's not much you can do. Then you just be polite and move on with your life. Um, you can make everyone like you, and I think it's a mistake to even to attempt to make people like you. Did I answer your question a little bit? I don't know. I appreciate the question. Yeah, in the back. Can I ask what year you are? I'm sorry. Can I ask what year you are? Okay, so you've been through. You've been. Through, uh, I thought maybe you were one else, but it's a different question than one on that three L. Uh, so, this is a far broad question removed from this this topic. But I'm, I'm happy to answer your question uh, to the best of my ability. Um, when I look at legal questions, right, I try to separate as much as I can how I view the law as a matter of policy versus how I view the law as a matter of legality. Um, it's not always easy to do that. So I'll just use DACA, an example. That's one that came up in the, in the clip. Um, you know, I think our immigration policy is insane. Uh, it's, you know, have 
12 million people here who can't work and do other things they should be able to do. I think it's just it's nuts, right? I also recognize political reality is a lot of people don't want them to be able to, be able to do work and vote and do other things, right? Um, so how do you deal with that, right? Uh, in an ideal world, we use the legal process to pass a statute that provides some sort of naturalization, whatever that happens to be. Uh, we haven't had any consensus in Congress to do that for the last 20, 25, 30 years. So then presidents, Obama and, and now Biden, decide to use executive action. Um, the DACA policy is a deferred action policy that allows certain people to work. Um, these are upstanding people. They contribute to society. They're doctors. They're lawyers. They do other things. Um, wonderful. I've had DACA students in my class before at my law school. I still think, I still think the policy is illegal. Um, I don't think the Congress enacted statutes that authorize that sort of broad deferred action. I think you have narrow relief for people who might be on the cusp of citizenship, but, but not for the class of a million people. So can I separate objectively how law impacts people from how, um, it, uh, how whether there's authorization? I can do it. Uh, not everyone wants or even, even wishes to, uh, but I try to. Now, I can take your question in a million different ways. Did I answer it at least a little bit? Please give me a follow-up. You help me out here. Yeah. How do we, you know, and, and I think the police theory to me is the antithesis of legal objectivity. <laughs> That's, yeah, 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 good point. So yeah. how do we, how do you reconcile the fact that there should be free speech, like yeah. the, the federal I, side's position that we don't put the police theory should be fine? Well, just, just to be clear, I don't think the federal side has a position. We don't, it, the, the entity doesn't actually take positions. Um, I don't support legislation from state houses that limit what can be taught. Uh, maybe I'm an outlier, but I, I think those are intrusions. And let me let me actually take your question in a little bit of a flip direction. A number of states have actually enacted laws that require discipline for students who protest. Right? In other words, so it's not the dean's decision to impose discipline. It's by state law they have to. And if a school fails to impose discipline, they can be withdrawing state funding. Okay, so Arizona and a couple other states enacted those laws. And they were actually asking me if they want to sort of endorse their laws because I'm like a poster child of protest. And I said, absolutely not. Right? What I told them is, I don't think universities, I'm sorry, I don't think state legislatures should be involved in micromanaging how educational institutions operate. Um, these are unique places, this room we're in right now, right? It's a unique space uh, because you, you you need to be exposed to things that you may not like, whether that's originalism or CRT, I think it applies easily. So to answer your question, I don't favor legislation that bans CRT. Uh, I, think it, I think it's nuts. So in fact, these legislations are so poorly drafted, they're probably void for vagueness. They're, they're probably unconstitutional um, on free speech grounds because you, you can't really define what CRT is. Now, I think that the way CRT is taught to a bunch of five-year-olds is insane and just a policy matter, but I think these laws are probably unconstitutional. It's even the flip, what I'm telling you. So maybe I answered your question. I don't know. Okay, good, good, good. Thanks so much. Good, good. Very good question. I appreciate that. All right, what else you guys got? Yeah, right here in the front, blue shirt. Uh, in the information age, do you observe the digital medium as a vice giving rise to a uniform, a uniform thought, like sort of uh, that you saw at Cooney uh, Law School, than it is at an age and seven age? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I think I mentioned earlier, I'm not a fan of social media. I think it's done potentially more harm than good. Um, and I, I didn't put this in my presentation, but while I was there, all these kids were tweeting pictures of me. They were Instagramming, you know, live of me, protesting me. So it became almost like they were not just trying to um, send a signal to their classmates, but also to the world that this is this evil person. So I think social media may have even exacerbated this event beyond it. But, but... I think it has a negative impact on our on our 
environment. Thank you. What other questions you guys have? Yes, yeah, oh, yeah, I've been patiently waiting. I had a question before. Uh, so uh, at this event, and probably everyone um, has seen videos of numerous other events, and every other sign says hate speech. Is that a legally recognized term? No, no, it's not a thing. Um, hate crimes are a thing. And to be precise, what is a hate crime? And I see there's actually a question in the queue. I'll get to that question later. So thank you for, for people in the chat. Um, <clears throat> Hate crimes are a thing. That is, if you murder someone with a mens rea or a racist intent, there can be a criminal enhancement. That's that's okay, right? That's a, that's a state law. It's recruiting a murder with, with certain mens rea. Hate speech is not a thing. Um, hello. Uh, it's a crime in other countries. Seth, what's on? My classmate. Good to see you, buddy. I haven't seen him in a while. Um, Hate speech is an offense in other countries. Um, it's not an offense here. Um, these kids who protest me would have loved to make it a hate crime offense, a hate speech event, but it's not. Merely saying something that other finds offensive is not a crime. Even racial slurs and invectives cannot be punished. There have been attempts to punish them. For example, uh, the state of Minnesota or, or the city of St. Paul, Minnesota had a law that banned cross burning because it was hateful, and the court said you can't do that. Uh, cross burning is actually unique because if it's done as a way to intimidate or threaten someone, that you can. You, you, you can't threaten a person, right? Threats are actually illegal. Even if I go up to you, I'm gonna punch you in the face, right? I can't, that's not free speech. So there's a category of what's called true threats. And if, if cross burning is done as a way to intimidate people, that could be a crime. But merely saying things that people find offensive is not. Um, <clears throat> There's a question in the queue from Andrew, and I, I do want to get to it's been sitting there for, for a while, um, about 3D printing guns. So I know you have a very, what else to do with my free time, right? Uh, so I know you have a very big IP program. Uh, I, I represent Cody Wilson, who is the founder of Defense Distributed. Um, and he was a person who was a law student like you who invented 3D printed guns. He was the first one to make a functional 3D printed gun. And we've been suing the Federal government and the state government for, oh my God, almost a decade now. It's, gone, uh, it's 2014, so almost seven years, right? It's been going forever. Um, eventually, we'll get a judgment. We're still kind of litigating. Um, but this is actually another aspect of free speech uh, jurisprudence. Um, the governments haven't actually banned the printing of 3D firearms. They've done actually something very different. They've tried to regulate the sharing of the files. So as we speak in New Jersey, if you were to download a file from the internet, you've committed a crime. If you were to share a file in New Jersey and download, you just committed a state offense. So I, I understand I understand the idea that uh, I assume that possessing a 3D printed firearm would be a federal. It's case. all well, uh, right because it's a firearm that doesn't have a, a serial number. Um, no, no, no. So, so here's the rule, right? It's illegal to buy a firearm in interstate commerce that has a serial number on it, right? But if you make it yourself, it's fine. So if, if you print it yourself under federal law, you can keep it on your, on your own. Okay. So then in that case, it seems like the New Jersey law is even that much less defensible. Right? Yeah. Because not only are they regulating speech, but they're regulating speech about something that is Hey, not in New Jersey. New Jersey, you can't have a 3D. They've also banned possession of 3D printed guns as well. But but your point is well taken, right? So the reason why I'm very passionate about the 3D printed gun litigation, it's not just one constitutional amendment, it's two. It's the First Amendment and the Second Amendment combined, right? It's you're literally speaking about the right to bear arms, right? It, it's both rights, what's called a hybrid right, that converge. And so I've been litigating this case now since 2014. Um, eventually, we'll get to a final judgment. It, what you'll learn is that courts move very, very slow, and you just keep waiting and appealing and going, we went up to the Supreme Court, back down, up to the, we'll probably go up to the Supreme Court again, but uh, it can take it forever. Okay, um, let's see, one and two, go ahead. Um, so I know a lot of this objection to sort of people showing up and protesting at these campuses is centered around, like, just because speech is offensive doesn't give you the right to shut it down. But do you think there is any kind of speech that is, whether 
direct fear to direct me harm. Because uh, I'm, I am not adapted to not libertarian, and I see these conversations. The conversation doesn't center around offensive speech, it centers around harmful speech. So do you think there are any kinds of speech that can cause harm? Okay, so there are probably some narrow categories. So one is I mentioned a threat, right? If I tell someone I'm going to beat you up, I think I can be charged with attempt with, with attempted battery, right, or threatened battery. I think you can't threaten to commit a crime. Uh, fraud is a, another class example. If I, you know, uh, I'm an accountant and I perform some fraudulent accounting, and I, you know, I do people have their money, I can't say, oh, my my uh, my, my books, my records are free speech, right? Uh, libel and slander, I think, are also pretty well-established exceptions, right? You can't slander someone. Uh, in fact, libel law may be due for free vision sometime soon because it's 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 become very hard to actually do meaningfully because social media, right? Any kid who gets picked up on social media, it becomes a public figure. And right, you remember the incident at the Washington uh, at the mall in Washington? Those those kids from uh, Kentucky a couple of years ago, they were they were there. One guy was wearing a Make America Great hat, and there was a Native American guy. And they, there was like a 30 second clip where it looked like he was taunting these guys, but the videos have context. And courts, some courts actually held that because he was in a video that went viral, he became a public figure, and therefore the higher standard for defamation applies to him that he can't win. Uh, so that might be another area that that's maybe might be uh, for review. Um, but I, I tend to take a very broad view of free speech. My livelihood depends upon it. If, if it's not free speech, I'm out of a job. Yeah, please. Yeah, and then I'll go to you. What if somebody is standing up and making the argument that like homosexuality is degenerate or like uh, like black people have low IQs or you know as a result of their genes? Do you think that kind of speech is harmful? Probably, probably probably hurts people, but I don't think it's banned. Um, you know, uh, to, to to your point, people do make those arguments. Um, to to say that we need to ban people saying that homosexuality is sinful, we'd have to ban a lot of people of faith. Who, who do believe that? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's biblical verses about that that topic. Um, you know, there are debates about affirmative action, um, and you know, it often involves test scores and race. And people may find that topic very hurtful, but people make those arguments. I, are we being kicked out in two minutes? Because other people are going. Okay. Well. Okay. I can. I'm. I'm here until you guys are done. So yeah. So right there. Go, go ahead, please. Yeah, it's actually a really good question. I do think there is a um, there's a generational gap, and I think people on the left who came of age in the '60s and '70s recognize the value of free speech. I think that's fading. I think today's left is more. I mean, look at these, you know, these people who are protesting my my lecture. Um, I do think I think there's a generational gap, and as the current era of students sort of phases out. And the current, those kids become lawyers and judges. I think we're screwed, right? You know, the current judges came of age in the 60s and 70s and 80s. When those kids get in the Supreme Court, I think we're toast. Yeah. Oh, yeah, welcome. You can finish class. Yeah. I don't know what shifted it. I, I, I really, I really don't know. But I think, I mean, Seth and I graduated law school in two thousand nine, so about, you know, about ten years ago. Things have changed a lot in a decade, haven't they? Yeah, I, I don't know what the shift was. It, it, it may, it may be social media, maybe part of it. I think the Obama presidency unsettled things in a lot of ways people don't fully appreciate. I think that that unseated things was a Tea Party movement, or with a huge up, you know, the huge social uprising. Um, you know, then you had the sort of Occupy Wall Street movement that came up as well. Um, and then you have, you know, the, the MAGA movement. So a lot of these forces just sort of just converged and, and uh, have led to this point. Um, also, to your point about CRT, I think generation students studying CRT, it's, it integrates off in society. People look at things differently than they may have done generations ago, and they'll see the same event and recognize that this is institutionally racist, right? They say, oh, well, this is, this, it is what it is, right? You know, it's not, it's not we're going to accept it. We're going to fight back. So 
I don't know what the, you know, the, the impetus for change was. There's definitely been a shift. Yes, that's. Did you see that shift on both sides of the I think so. Yeah, I think there's. less speech. I think the, 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 the middle is, think of it as a spectrum, the middle is shrinking and the poles are getting bigger. Um, I read a study a couple years ago. I haven't looked at it recently, but it was fascinating. You know, one measure of a person's tolerance is the question, would you be okay if your child married X, right? So for many years, they asked the question, would you be okay if your child married a person of the opposite race? And you know, that's gone skyrocket. I was like, yeah, of course, I have no problem. Right? In the 50s, it's very low. And then today, it's like, of course, I have no objection if it's interracial marriage, right? So another question they ask is, would you be okay if your child married someone of the opposite political party? That's going down. So in other words, people are more okay with interracial marriage and less okay with interparty marriage. That's just crazy to think about. So I think just the middle is sort of hollowing out and the poles are getting bigger, uh, which, which uh, is problematic. I, Please, go ahead. Yeah. I, just, I mean, the way that I, I view it, and I don't know if this is the right way to look at it, but it seems to me that most of the most, uh, the strongest uh, case law that we have protecting speech came out of very, yeah. very liberal leaning courts in the 60s and 70s. That's true. Um, and most of the pushback against the increase of free speech has come from the right. Isn't that I funny? Think, yeah. I think the most um, extreme example that I can remember is I remember reading. There was a case about Westboro Baptist Church on the Supreme Court, and they were protesting military views. Yep. And um, you know, of course, they have these very evocative, provocative signs that upset a lot of people. And they would be at funerals for pe processions for people who were going to die in Iraq. And uh, I, I believe that the only dissent in that was Alito, That's right. who was at that time probably the most conservative member of the court. And Alito didn't have a free speech argument. It was just like, I can't believe you guys think this is okay. Which to me is is kind of a very conservative view. Yeah, um, but, yeah. But, but it also kind of, it seems like the left has become, perhaps you could say, more conservative in that way. About yeah, yeah. And I think we're just about time, so I'll maybe end up with this, with this question from Seth. I think this is a reverse, right? Generally, who favors free speech and who opposes it? If you're in the majority, you don't need the First Amendment because you can speak because you're in the majority, right? The people who need... Free speech protection is those who are in the minority because they need protections, right? So what happens when the people who were in the minority become in the majority and the people who were in the majority fall back to being the minority? Conservatives today on college campuses stay in the same position as the socialists on campus 50 years ago, right? So the same arguments that the democratic socialists from Mecca are arguing 50 years ago is what the right-wing people are arguing today. So it's this bizarre reversal. And that's why I said, it's basically flipping the power structure. Those who were oppressed are now oppressing, and those who were oppressed are now being, opp those who are oppressing are now being oppressing, if that right, you know what I'm saying, right? So it's this reversal where the people who are draping themselves in the First Amendment are the same type of people who would have been saying, you guys shut up 50 years ago. Good place to stop, you guys shut up. All right, any other questions? Thank you all so much, that was lovely. Very much enjoyed the discussion. Bye-bye, everyone on Zoom land.